Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this um, freezing and slightly damp night. And um, and thank you so much uh, for joining us in person. I know that we also have a not in person component to this evening, and that's um, really wonderful. And I'm so glad that everybody at home is also joining us. But um, super, super excited to have you guys here at the Kelly Writers House uh, for an in person event, which has been uh, so difficult to, to do in recent years. But mm -hmm. um, but I'm so glad that we get to be here to celebrate uh, Professor Waiki Bong's new book, uh, Joan is OK. Lots of copies available in the back if you guys are interested. Um, this event is sponsored by the Creative Writing Program here at Penn and, of course, the Kelly Writers House. Um, I'm Piali Bhattacharya. I'm faculty here in creative writing. I teach fiction and nonfiction, much like Waiki. Um, and of course, I'm here today reading with Professor Waiki Wong. And um, the person who we are missing, of course, is Sully Burns, who was going to be here this evening um, and who I believe is Waiki's student and yeah. uh, unfortunately couldn't join us this evening. So if you see Sully, say, tell him we missed him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled to be introducing uh, Waiki's work to those of you that may not be familiar with it. Um, to give you a formal bio, Waiki is the author of the novels Chemistry and Joan is OK. Uh, she's the recipient of the 2018 Penn Hemingway Award, uh, a Whiting Award, and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35. She earned her MFA from Boston University and her other degrees from Harvard. She currently lives in New York City and teaches here at Penn. Um, it's a remarkable biography, but I was a little bit more interested in telling you about why Waiki's work has been important to me as a <coughs> writer. Um, and hopefully some of you writers in here will sort of recognize some of the things that I say. All of us writers are obsessed with language, but Waiki pays attention to minute words and phrases. Maybe she's not the first person to do this, but for me, reading her first novel, Chemistry, which is right here, was like coming home. Mm -hmm. Because she is the first person to notice phrases so intimately and so thoroughly in two different languages and therefore in two different cultural contexts. When I read Chemistry, which is about a graduate student who is getting her degree in chemistry and who is also figuring out whether or not she has romantic chemistry with her boyfriend, I found a woman whose brain worked a lot like mine. All my life, I've been trying to figure out the ways in which the phrases we use in English influence the way we think in English. <coughs> and all my life, I've been asking myself the question, is the same true for the Bengali that I speak at home with my family? What if the narrator of chemistry has Asian thoughts, whatever that means, and we will <laughs> talk about that, <laughs> specifically because she speaks an Asian language mm. in addition to English? Mm -hmm. How does she then express her Asian thoughts in English? There's a lot more I want to say about this, including specific <coughs> passages I want to point out to you. Um, when Waiki and I start having our discussion after the readings. Um, but Waiki's attention to language is something I'll ask you to pay attention to as you listen to her read today. To talk to you a little bit more about Joan is OK, you should know that Joan is a Chinese American woman who is also an ICU doctor in New York at the time when COVID hits the United States. To be this is already to be multiple things. A Chinese woman at the time of the Chinese virus and Asian hate. A woman in medicine, which can sometimes be a contradiction in terms. A woman straddling being the daughter of immigrants with the ideas of immigration and assimilation themselves. These are not questions that are divorced from my own work and a lot of Asian American writers' work. And when we started talking about this event, Waiki and I realized that we both have been writing about Asian Americans in medicine, and that we also have a lot of, a lot of other overlaps, um, an obsession for trying to figure out why expressing bicultural self in a given form of language always feels like an act of incompletion and also an act of multiplicity a constant state of bewilderment over what it means to be an Asian American woman in a creative writing space specifically. Mm -hmm. And of course, our fascination with the things that we learn from our mutual students at Penn, which is you guys. So before Waiki shares more of Joan with you, and before we have a little chat about all of those things, 
I wanted to share something that I've been working on recently, and I specifically wanted to share this little piece because it's it's a piece that I have been thinking through that Joan is Okay really helped me to, to think about. It's a passage from a novel that I've been working on that centers on South Asian American immigrants in New York, specifically a Bangladeshi American undocumented chef, an Indian American documented physician, and the restaurant that is owned by the doctor and where the chef cooks. But this passage isn't about the restaurant. It's about an Indian physician thinking about what it means to practice medicine in India versus in America, and also what it means to practice obstetrics and gynecology specifically, which of course is a specialty that focuses on women's care and women's bodies. It starts in the 1970s when the character is still in medical school in India and ends with him reflecting on his career in private practice here in the States. <clears throat> Water and mask, bad combination. <laughs> Um, okay. It was dark by the time Probij started his walk back to the residence hall, but he hardly noticed. All this time, he'd been so focused on dissections in the lab, procedures in the clinic. Never once had Probij actually seen a patient's face, sat in a room with them so that he might read their expressions as well as their charts. Surgery was thrilling, and it could produce miracles. Still, those miracles would only ever be stalls for the enemy that was always coming. What, then, was the role of the doctor in the ministration of medicine and surgery? All of the medical college lecturers described the experience the same way. Patient comes in, doctor dispenses advice, patient gets better if he follows the rules. But what if the patient was not in an environment where following the rules was possible? What if the patient was not a he? When he got back to his residence hall, Proby knew exactly which book to look for. It was a catalog of surgical procedures, each outlined in pragmatic terms, each drawn to depict male patients. Appendectomy, pneumonectomy, coronary artery bypass. Male, male, male. As if women could never have these ailments. Frantically, he searched for the procedures that could only be performed on women, cesarean section, mastectomy, hysterectomy. None of these were in the book. They were listed in a separate volume, a reader helpfully titled Female Techniques. That one was on his shelf too, and he reached for it, flipped through the pages until the illustrations were blurring in front of him. If he took anything to New York City with him, it was this, the knowledge that he wanted to help, help women, help women in women's bodies. And then he was, in Manhattan, at Lenox Hill Hospital. If Proby thought he'd been soaking in bodies before, he hadn't seen the half of it. So many things were hard about those first years in America, but not this, not the bodies. The kinds of bodies Proby saw in those years, and the women. The sheer numbers and varieties. All the world lived in New York, and it made Proby realize that his patients up until then had been nearly 100% Indian. But the women in New York, their unfathomably complicated backgrounds, the stories they told about what they needed because of what had been done to them, what they had done to themselves, what they had endured, dangers and distresses, and just plain risks of a sort that Proby had rarely heard of. Stories from places Probeed had only read about, and yet stories that felt so familiar because they lived in the universality of the body. Cut open a body, and it is the same the world over. One of the true gifts of medicine, its humanity, its utter and most primitive proof of equality. Black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies, petite bodies, obese bodies, trans bodies, lesbian bodies, raped bodies, cancered bodies, scarred bodies, mutilated bodies, baby bodies, mommy bodies. Each one held mystery, and each the safety of home base, of anatomy. There were nights when he could barely <coughs> wait to get home to his wife to tell her what he'd seen that day, what new discovery he'd made about womankind. By the time Proby finished residency, he'd sure, he was sure he'd seen every woman's body there was to see on Earth without ever having to leave New York. This gift only America could have given him, this place which stood on the precipice of both the Atlantic and the Pacific, positioned directly between the poles. 
this place that advertised itself as such a group of everybody's. Then private practice. Here, medicine wasn't just about the rush of winning against God. A fetus in distress now breathing normally, a years-long battle ending in the correct diagnosis of endometriosis, a finicky fibroid successfully removed. There were moments when Broby felt invincible. The best relationships were those of duration, the ones in which he monitored a patient over 10 or 15 years, knowing of her family's history of uterine cancer, ushering her through her pregnancies in her 20s, guiding her through her hysterectomy in her 30s, holding her hand when she cowered in fear at her own body, which was suddenly changing faster than any of her friends, talking her through how to control all her symptoms and reminding her that she was, against all odds, a mother and she was alive a most unlikely win. More unlikely even than the joy of the days that came later, years later, 20 years into practicing in Westchester County. A mother walking in with her daughter, herself a mother-to-be, herself having been delivered by Proby decades earlier. How many triumphs can one count over a career in gynecology? Haven't they been worth all the losses? And yet, Brobeat cannot let go of the question his mentor had asked him on the day he'd strode into his office, ready to announce, Sir, I'm going to study obstetrics and gynecology. I'm going to help women. Mukherjee, the older man, had said, skepticism so heavy on his face that his spectacles slid down the bridge of his nose from the weight of it. What do you know about what it means to help? Thank Wonderful. You. Can we give Yali a round of applause? Oh my God. You should, you should read your own audio book when this comes out. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, Yali, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I don't think I've been introduced so well. I'm going to have to take that speech and just <laughs> frame it. Um, but thank you so much for your care that you took to introduce the work, um, talk about chemistry, and also that beautiful piece that you picked to read in conversation with um, the selection from Joan. Um, so I'm so grateful that you're here. Oh, I'm, um, I'm so excited to talk about Joan. I have many things yeah. that, I, that I want to pull, no, pull out. No, she has, you, you're so <laughs> professorial. I love it. You should take my job and then you can. <laughs> um, it's wonderful. OK, so on the heels of that, um, I think we all know that Joan is now an ICU doctor. Um, so not in ob but working at the ICU. Um, and I'm going to start around page 14. And this is um, after, um, you know, in the 14 pages, what has happened is her father has died, and then she's gone to China for a weekend and then come back. So I'm not giving you any spoilers. It's the first 14 pages. Um, and now Joan is back at the hospital. A common confusion is between intensive and emergency care. The latter is chaotic, usually on the first floor near the ambulance drop-off, in a room without dividers or enough beds. Someone might scream, doctor, and because no one answers, that person screams on. Intensive care is just the opposite. It's the best care that a hospital can give. And the room is quiet, except for machine sounds, alarms that go on and off. Just as radiologists know their imaging, ICU doctors know machines, ones that push oxygen into you, the almighty vent, ones that clean your blood, dialysis, the pumps, aka drips, that deliver medication and sedation through a central line directed to the heart. With many machines come many tubes, the endotracheal tube down the throat and to the vent for air, the nasogastric tube to the stomach for food, rectal tubes for stool, a Foley for the bladder, etc. Fluid control was imperative. Too much fluid in and the body would swell. Too much fluid out and it would desiccate. At my interview three years ago, the director asked why I chose intensive care. And I said I liked the purity of it, the total sense of control. Machines can tell you things that the people attached to them can't, I said. I liked that the sick didn't stay with us long, but for the stent that they do, we give it our all. A sprinter, I describe myself. The idea of longitudinal care was not for me. My director praised my honesty and offered me the attending position right there. More so than any authority figure I'd ever met before, he seemed to believe in me and agreed with my point about machines. 
From then on, we knew that we were a match. I knew that we were a match. In any specialty, an attending is expected to lead and guide her interns and residents along in their careers. To become an attending, I had trained for 12 years. The job was to teach machine readings, and a question I like to ask was, how is this patient interacting with her machine? What's the dance there like? If a patient fought, machine and patient became dyssynchronous. If they danced, the two were synchronous. Usually the patient fought. Our innate drives to breathe and to dance alone are strong. I taught, on average, three to five hours a day. The other hours were spent supervising. Procedures that I did in half the time pre-attending, I watched someone else do in double. If learning required mistakes, then teaching required watching different people make the same mistakes. Teaching was, was, teaching was relentless deja vu, but grounding. It cemented the idea that we are all the same. Height and weight did not matter, and the possibility of failure or success for anyone was never too far off. To streamline the instruction process, I had a habit of printing double-sided handouts. And during, during morning rounds, the sound that I waited for and enjoyed most was that of my eight-person team, the pharmacists included, turning their pages in unison and on cue. The sound reminded me of the wind, which reminded me of being outside, which I currently was not. At my first year review, the director asked if I liked my new role here. I said I did. Did I respect my team? I said I respected them on more days than not. He commended my honesty again. Anything else he could help me with, anything at all. As part of my hiring package, I had been given my own private office, but I didn't like how it echoed or how far I had to walk from unit to office, cafeteria to office, office to another office, wasting time. A smaller, more centrally located space comes with people, the director warned, as in you would have to share it with your colleagues. And is that what you want? I said I would like to try. Soon I was relocated to a shared office with other attendings the hospital had hundreds of doctors, but only 10 or so for three ICUs. To my left and right sat Madeline and Reese. Before I moved in, they had heard things about me, all true. The private office went to an older cardiologist who also wrote philosophical books about death. I tried to read one, but put it down. The books were too thick, with indexes alone of 100 pages. Death was inevitable. I didn't know what else there was to say. How was China, Reese asked Monday morning when I had returned. He was heading to the surgical ICU as I was going into cardiac. We were passing each other in the corridor meant for equipment. I relayed my cousin's message that the country has changed. Buildings were taller and fatter, as well as the people. Obesity would soon be a problem since food was ubiquitous, along with very high-tech phones. Everyone had a phone, and everyone paid with their phones. The economy was cashless. But how's your family, I mean? I asked why he wanted to know that. You never talk about them, he said. And then this terrible thing happens. I keep wondering if you and your father were strange. Was there a small, teensy, generational or cultural gap? To illustrate how teensy, Reese brought his pointer finger a centimeter away from his thumb. I said my father was entirely supportive of my path. And who wouldn't be, said Reese, standing with both hands on his waist above the belt in a pose that he called his power stance. Great paths, both of us. Not many people can do what we do. But put another way, what's your fondest memory of him, your father? I started to say something, but then forgot the memory and the rest of my thoughts. No wonder, Reese said. No wonder what? He didn't tell me and then quickly changed the topic. How long have you been single, he asked. All of my life. No boyfriends ever? I shook my head. Fascinating. No crushes in school, no one night stands in college. I said I was busy, but you weren't studying all the time. In fact, I was. I asked if he thought my singleness could have something to do with my personality. Your personality is fine. Maybe my looks, you're a vision. I laughed because I knew the kind of women Reese liked. They usually had lashes. He was the vision and handsome enough to have his picture grace three of our hospital brochures for critical care. It has happened before. A family member comes in from the waiting room and flaps one of our blue leaflets around. Is this doctor in, they ask, pointing to the picture? <laughs> because they want only the best and this stately face of medicine for their unconscious and sedated loved one. Don't take this the wrong way, Reese added. 
but you're a catch, and you shouldn't have to look that hard. Any guy would be lucky. Not me, unfortunately. We know each other too well, and I'm madly in love with Madeline. But let me know how I can help. Here was our motto, as it, as it was in any ICU. Are you suffering from ARDS, sir, madam? Because if so, we can help. What is ARDS? Yes, sir, madam, we understand too many acronyms, not enough time. ARDS is Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, or Severe Inflammation of Your Lungs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Waiki. And yeah. I'm so glad that that is the passage that you chose to read, only because it segues perfectly into my the, the part of the evening that I've been waiting to get to, um, which is the part where I get to point out to all of you guys a couple of my uh, favorite moments of language in Joan is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you all the sort of normal questions that one asks an author who has a book out <laughs> about like, where does a book come from in right. your brain and like all those different things. But as an entry point, sure. because I love this, this particular kind of, of thing so much, I wanted to start with the thing that I'm, I'm guessing is also what you start with, which is how language, and I, I mentioned this before, but how language always has multiple meanings mm -hmm. and how everything we say um, is both imperfect perfect and incomplete, and also has more layers than we think it does. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to point out two little things from Joan um, that, that I wanted to talk to you about. So the first awesome. one is really, really early in the book. It's just on page six. Um, th and this is where our uh, protagonist, Joan, is about to go to China because her father has just passed. And, it's, and he's there, and, and she needs to go to the funeral. And, and you know it's a very sad moment for her. Um, but she doesn't tell her colleagues why she's going, because it's none of their business. And um, this is how they react. They asked where I was going. And I said, China, but just for the weekend. Then I turned from them and started packing my things. Fine, don't tell us, said Reese. I know what it is, Madeline said with a mischievous glint. You're off to get married. You're going to elope. Elope is a funny word, and in hospital speak for patients, meant to leave the building at the risk of yourself <laughs> and without a doctor's consent. So many meanings in those few <laughs> little sentences alone. And then I actually just want to skip ahead um, to page 145. Um, and this is where uh, COVID is just starting to break out. And uh, Joan is having a conversation with her white and male neighbor, mm. um, who she lives across the hall from. And she says to him, I said, I was worried about Wuhan and by extension China. I had him look at the images. And even after I translated, he didn't seem too concerned. Yeah, but didn't the SARS outbreak peter out? The virus mutated within a month or something. At least that's what he'd been reading online. I said, each virus is different. No two are alike. Like snowflakes, he said. And I said nothing. Because a virus was nothing like a snowflake. <laughs> and <laughs> I just love that <laughs> sentence so much. And I wanted us to maybe start our discussion. That was with a real <laughs> conversation I have. With oh, someone. please tell us about this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> You know, I mean, well, it's it's one of these things where as a, as a and you know this now you're researching kind of how to write physicians that they learn all this great knowledge and, you know, specificity and lingo. And then when they're trying to connect with patients or people who have not gone through this training, they really have to, like, break it down in a way that you don't want to seem like you're, you know, talking above them, below them, but you want to get through the importance of it. And so I think Joan at that point is do I tell him or do I just let this conversation peter out in a certain well, way? Well, <laughs> exactly. And I think the thing that I really wanted to ask you about that sentence is that yeah. the, I think the word that just is going to be stuck in my brain forever is the word snowflake, because <laughs> I think of snowflake as being just an incredibly American word. I don't mm -hmm. think that it's a word that pretty it's much true. any other country uses the way that yeah. we use it. Um, because you can say someone is a snowflake, right? Right. And, and it means so many different yes, things. Yes. Um, but I was I was wondering, like, where where Joan's uh, both uh, like sort of upbringing and also sentimentality come into her use of the word snowflake in mm -hmm. that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think she is probably thinking, you know, just that, I mean, sure, they're both inanimate things, but one is 
just precipitation, right? And the other one can wreak total havoc on something um, when when they infect it. And it, I think she's just not understanding the connection that Mark is trying to make. And Mark is a little bit more literary. He's more like humanities driven. Yeah. He sort of has this kind of idealistic idea of things. And I think she's just not sure how to connect with him on a certain level yeah. because she, in some ways, is very no-nonsense sort of scientific um, and once you're outside of that box for her, she kind of doesn't really know how to interact with this Mark character. Um, and I think I was just playing around the fact that um, Mark seems like he would be probably a sensitive guy anyway if, you know, you, you, you sort of engaged him in, um, I guess, aggressive conversation. Um, and if Joan had really tried to correct his worldview about viruses i don't i don't necessarily think it would go well no no i doubt it <laughs> yeah um, yeah so okay so that that is exactly the kind of thing i, w- I was thinking about with her mm-hmm. and then also with you which is my, like my my awkward way of asking you like was this like a co- covid book for you did it start there or did it just kind of end up there Oh my god, girl, this book, this book, okay, so just publishing and how inefficient publishing is, as you know, because I complained to you about this on the phone, Um, I turned this book in February 2020, I turned the draft of this book in February 2020, Um, there's no pandemic, no COVID, and it was done, and then um, March happened, right, and then I had a very difficult conversation with my editor, which basically meant you probably need to rewrite the entire half of the book because when this comes out even if there is no covid which Mm -hmm. you know that didn't happen um but even when this comes out um no reader will accept and you know publishers and professors say this a lot what is the reader going to accept is a reader going to accept a chinese american icu doctor who does not engage in the realities of this pandemic or this virus do you then set it way before because then you mm. need to put a time stamp and if you set it way before then there needs to be a reasoning for it so after a while and thinking about it a lot and being very depressed that I had to rewrite the entire thing again <laughs> um I, I you know I got back on the horse and then recrafted the later half to make COVID a little bit more integrated but not like ancillary you know I think I wanted it to be part of her work part of her mother's narrative but I didn't want it to just be this like anxiety that she's dealing with because I think um, as a as a physician working in the ICU she's very good at sort of just like this is work and then when I'm not at work this you know I'm not if I'm not on service I'm not on service if I'm off service whatever so she's very good at kind of boxing that together um, but it was hard I mean I think I was I wanted to give up on this so many times since you know, writers, and if you're writing about the pandemic, you never know whether it's going to take over the book or yeah. not be enough, right? right? I mean, I think writers after 9-11 were dealing with that, too. Absolutely, yeah, They yeah, didn't yeah, know yeah, how yeah. to incorporate that. Without... It's, just, it's too huge. It's like, too how huge. You, it, there's nothing you can say that people aren't going to be like, well, clearly she's talking about COVID. You right, know? <laughs> right, right. Oh. So it's like, how do you talk about it without making it the core of the story, right? right, right? right. But also acknowledging that the story has to be there. Yeah. That's fascinating. So like okay, if I can ask then then what was the core of the story for you mm-hmm. in if I had asked you in February of 2020 when you were panting <laughs> in that first draft, where did yeah. that story come from then? Well, the story came from just writing um an Asian American female doctor because I'm just fascinated by women working in certain fields, mm-hmm. um especially male dominated fields like yeah. STEM. Um I think Asian Americans probably represent like 25% of the health force, to be honest, right? Um, And I don't necessarily think they're featured in any sort of media, fiction, things like that, in a sense. Or even on TV, like on commercials, you know, and brochures. Or any of the TV doctors. Right, right. Like all the the doctor shows. Yeah, like, Like, you know, the main protagonist, right? The protagonist (laughs) who's saving lives. You know, they never center their story on that. And I feel like sometimes the character like Joan is always the flat peripheral character you know who's funny in a scene but then like you forget about her you know the 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 main character has the real journey or whatever i mean Grey's anatomy has been going on for 16 years right she is still where are the asians yeah she's still (laughs) working in that hospital um so i think it was the (laughs) frustration of 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 sort of seeing a lot of this and i was pre-med for so long and then you know i did my rounds in that kind of field um and now most of my colleagues are you know in their fellowship or whatnot um and I think they, they are seeing sort of some of the sense of being replaceable, but also being told you have to step up and do the work, but you're also replaceable. Um, and it was that narrative I was trying to get into the story. 
Um, her exit from the hospital was not as streamlined without, you know, the working some of the other stuff in there. Mm. But it was the same story. It just, I, I needed to get the mechanics of it. You know, writing is a lot like surgery. Like, you don't care about, mm -hmm. you know, the longitudinal kind of, like, trajectory. You care about how it's going to work. Totally. Right? Totally. So it was just, like, taking the guts out again and then yeah. figuring out how to connect the, you know, connect everything together. Um, oh, but, that is the worst part. Uh, <laughs> I just would not do it again. I mean, I tell my students this all the time, and they, you know, they're. All, I'm always like, you need to revise, you need to edit, and they're like, no. I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is really the the main part of writing. Though. It is. Like, I just, I feel is. like anything you put down on paper, even the first, second, third, fourth time, even, is just like. Yeah, okay, you put that there. Good for you. That's Good like not you. where it's going to yeah. stay. So yeah. like oh. um yeah, absolutely. Um oh my gosh, I can't believe that uh for for a book that I've been touting about as being a, a COVID book is it wasn't at all original. No, it was a amazing. struggle and sort of like my editor I think had a very strong opinion that I needed to put it in there. But you know, editors let you arrive at this opinion yourself. So she like <laughs> waits you out for like three weeks. While you have like a meltdown. Yeah, on your while couch. I have a meltdown. <laughs> and, then, and then she's like, I'm like, you know, you're right. And she's like, Oh, I'm so glad you you know, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like we, right? were, we were literally just talking about yeah. this on the phone where I was like, yeah, my, my agent has just told me that you should do this, this, and this, and this to the manuscript. And, and like the first couple ends. of weeks, it I was like, ends. what is she talking about? She has no idea what she's saying. And like a couple of weeks yeah. later, I was like, yeah. yeah. But you arrived on this <laughs> yeah. decision yourself. You did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the, the, the horrible part of that is that like, is like cutting out some of the things that you thought were final right, and like you thought, right. well, okay. So this is, right. this brings me to my, my next passage that mm. I wanted to just talk to you about, which was, um, where is it? 169. Okay. This is something that, um, I just absolutely loved the idea of this is, this is where I really want to get into talking about like what, what what it means to be writing a character who is thinking and writing in English, but who the character is also thinking in a different language, right? And this is um, Joan, um, whose Chinese name is Juan. Um, this is uh, what she talks about. Each Chinese sound has four tones, and within each tone of a sound, there are many characters. The strokes of the characters matter for balance, symmetry. It's meant to be art. Ju, Fourth tone, 12 strokes, means at once, or right away, or moving toward. An, first tone, six strokes, is peace, or taken apart, it's a roof, under which there is a woman. What this woman does, no one really knows. She might be happy or sad. She might be hardworking or indolent. But put this woman in a house, and you will have serenity and ease. Juan or just peace, or simply a woman in a house. There's so much going on in these few little sentences that have to do with gender, gender mm -hmm. in China, gender in English, gender in Chinese. Like, the, what what is going on here? And um, if you guys have the book, I encourage you to open to page 169 only because it's very worth looking at what the characters actually look like, and, the, and they are in the book. Um, and when she says, uh, it, taken apart, it's a roof. It's literally like a little roof. Um, yeah. And it's it's just a beautiful... It's just a beautiful meditation in English on a Chinese word. Right. I mean, I think um, I had a lot of trouble coming up with the name of this character. Mm. I needed a mm. character where I could, you know, my first book didn't have any names um, because of just with names come sort of identity issues and whether you wanted to get into that or not. And I, I didn't necessarily know I wanted to get into that. So with the second book, I knew... Um, I wanted to name the characters because it can help, you know, having named characters. Um, and with Joan, I wanted it to be a simple name that it was very easy, you know, in English to write. But also you could there would be a Chinese version that would be also very easy to translate. It might not be, you know, the most beautiful or fancy um, Chinese name, but it would be interchangeable. And the reason I did this is because. Some of my friends are, you know, having kids now, and they're kind of thinking, "What should I? What should I name this kid? I want to name this kid some, something that can translate into this language, but be also okay in this language, and then I can find some characters and some overlap." Um, and sort of, a, that's really hard, you know, to find names that are overlapped <laughs> yeah. um, and kind of have a similarity. 
And the way that I learned Anne as a character was just like this. My teacher, or, you know, I guess my mom, was like, here's the house, and this is the woman in the house. And I, was, and I think as a kid, I was like, why is the woman in the house? And she's like, she's just <laughs> she in just the house. <laughs> um, and so I think... But also women are in houses. Women like, always are in houses. Yeah. Why not? Um, so... So the way that I think I memorize characters and learn characters is just kind of like telling that tiny story. Not every character has a story, but right. this story really stayed with me just yeah. because it was like, yeah. you know, you, you could have a woman in a house and it would be peaceful, but then, I don't know, like look at Jane Eyre and Bertha in the yeah. house. She's like, try to burn it down, right? <laughs> so like not super peaceful, but but I think that kept coming back as like, oh. Bertha is my favorite woman in my favorite I, house. It's great. She's the best woman in right. my house. And yeah. total contradicts this character, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think at every moment, this kind of remembering that story that I learned to learn this character has sort of been an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just knew if I can create this character and make it into a name, it would be easy mm-hmm. to kind of have a significance to that. So, Do you mind pronouncing the name for us? Because oh. I'm sure I didn't do it. Probably. No, it was fine. <laughs> Jian. Jian. Okay, cool. Um, I just, I, yeah, I, I love, and I, I'm, I'm, I hope we get to talk more about that because I just, I love the idea that like the, the Chinese characters can be a part of the retelling of this story right, in English. Right. Like that just is something where I feel like I'm all, I'm always at the intersection of that and I'm always kind of being like, how? <laughs> how, do you right, do how do you translate it? Right. Um, speaking of which, I was wondering if I could ask you a little bit about like what it, so you've been at like in a science space. I know your degree, uh, your undergrad degree was in chemistry. You also have yeah. an MPH. You uh, also have an MFA. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what it has I meant? I actually <laughs> went all the way stupidly and got a doctorate <laughs> in epidemiology. Can yes. you imagine this? And I thought, what's the use of epidemiology? <laughs> so, you know, like eight years ago, ten years ago, and I thought, gosh. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, I think it was kind of a very slow transition into writing. Um, I, you know, chemistry, I did an undergrad in chemistry. Um, and... While I I think it was very, you know, I learned a lot. Um, I think I, had I been at a different school, I probably would have just gone to grad school for mm. chemistry and been probably perfectly happy. Mm. Um, but, you know, Harvard sort of sucks your dreams out from under you and sort of <laughs> makes you feel bad. Um, so that was four years of like an undergrad degree in a lab that was really intense and sort of made me re- rethink basic science research. And then I thought, do I want to be a doctor? So I shadowed this cardiologist for two years as a clinical researcher and that didn't go as well as I thought it was gonna go <laughs> um and and then I was just you know in at Longwood at, at you know in Boston and then um the school of public health had this program and I thought this is a great compromise right it's like mm-hmm. sort of in between you know the basic sciences but I still have like health applications um and I could learn how to code who doesn't want to learn how to code um <laughs> biostatistics and things like that not writers learn learn how to learn how to do r (laughs) you know that was my life um and then i think at the end of that like six years later while i was i was also doing the mfa i just realized that i really love writing right i'm gonna kind of strike out with writing in terms of the thesis and that was chemistry and i've just been kind of very lucky in terms of the the books and having readers and having kind of an audience um but i would say that one of the things i was worried about is once I stopped publishing in science, um, sort of once I stopped kind of processing data, I was afraid I was going to miss it. I was afraid I was going to miss sort of data processing, and I don't. So I feel <laughs> in a, in some ways I've kind of made the right decision. Um, but I, I realized if I stopped writing, I would, I would really miss it. You know, you just – that's, I think, one of the things where if I don't write for a couple months, I really want to sort of start writing something. But if I don't code for months, I'm, I'm not – I'm not like missing it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and how much of writing is processing? Right. right? There's right, also that, right. which a different kind of processing for sure. But right. like, um, there's this great essay by I think Pam Zhang wrote uh, yes. that uh, walking is writing, right. and making bread is writing, and taking a bath about is about writing. It. Yeah, and it is. But and it's it, also it is. a terrible thing because you're thinking about it all the time. Like yeah. a lot of the times with other things, you can just step away uh, from and it, and it's actually over. It's writing over. is never over. <laughs> it's, it's never over, over. and you're f- problem solving. In, you know, in the middle of the night and totally. things like that. Yeah. Totally. Um, you had mentioned that you were interested in, um, like, people in, in like, sort of juxtaposed spaces. So, like, women in medicine, for example, yes, was something yes. you were interested in when you were creating Jonah as a character. And I'm wondering how being an Asian-American woman has felt for you in creative writing. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If, right. if the Asians are not depicted on Grey's Anatomy, then I, <laughs> I dread to think if there were a show about writers. Or writers and who would be in that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, I think it's definitely been somewhat of a struggle, you know. Um, in, I mean, I think teaching writing is very different because you're sort of in charge of how the, the class goes. But um, I, I would say my MFA experience was actually quite great. Um, but a lot of, you know, being a, an Asian-American writer in this is you, you have to there's certain things that you have to tell the reader that maybe like, like a white writer would never need to do. Mm -hmm. Like my characters Mm -hmm. are white instead Mm -hmm. of, you know, my characters are Asian. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is there's a lot of explaining that you sort of have to kind of embed into the story. Thank you. Oh my God. I talk about this all the time. How do you do this with economy? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think I just edit and then put stuff in and edit and put stuff in. But I think sometimes, you know, when I'm teaching and I have to convince the student, you have to do this. They get, I get a lot of resistance, Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm like, if you don't tell me, the identity of this character, I'm going to assume it's the dominant culture, no matter what, um, just because it's like the odds, right? Um, and I'm never going to assume that if you're a certain identity, you're going to write a character of a certain identity. That's the worst assumption. Um, so sometimes with being you know, a minority person in writing, you, you just have to kind of think about what do I have to explain? What do I not have to explain, right? Honestly, and it's yeah. such a, it's a, it's for me at least it's a process of deletion, right? right because right. I tend to, I like I've realized that I, I don't know if this is the case for you, but I tend to write really long. Mm. And I mm. realized that part of the reason why I'm writing mm. so long is that I'm just explaining so much of my character along right. the way. Because like, you're worried that I'm the, so the worried reader, that nobody's going to get it. No like, and then it. it's only in the second draft that I'm just like, yeah. okay, but what is crucial? Like, which mm-hmm. is the crucial sentence that they need to know right. in order to know about this <clears throat> dish or this whatever right. moment, right. Or, you know? Right. Um, um, and I, I do think it's actually important to explain it because, you know, I've heard the argument, well, if you don't explain it and you just put it in there, the reader's going to look it up. P- probably not. The reader will probably just put the book down, <laughs> you know, yes. because they're going to be confused. So And bored. In, in bo- and bored. And they're going to be, like, lost or they're going to feel insulted. So sometimes it's a balance of what do I have to describe, right? Like, in here, there's this dinner scene where, you know, her mom makes her its own and. I'm thinking, yeah, sure, you could Google that and figure out what it is, but it takes me, like, you know, one line to explain what that is to a reader, and maybe that's helpful, and maybe that will actually encourage them to look into this. And I know in some ways, you know, certain writers don't have to do that. You, like, with lasagna, no one's sitting there at lasagna. It is a By multi-layered, way, is a multi-layered yeah. sauce, pasta, right? No one has to do this. Or French mm. food, or, yeah. like, certain kinds of Italian food that's so ingrained in American culture, you never have to explain it. But... And also just the French language sometimes, or Spanish, or Italian, sometimes I just see like washes of it in the sentence as if I'm supposed to know I think about this it, all right? the time because it's Roman script, so, right. that, so we can read the words can and read have it. cognates. But and, imagine yeah. if I just wrote an entire sentence in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> how, how is anyone going to check that up, or look into it, or read it, right? And so there's a lot of things that I have to have to think about in terms of balancing, explaining, but not pandering, but not like losing some of the integrity of the prose. Right. Um, Losing the integrity of the prose is really the big one for yeah, me because I feel yeah. like I, I I write this thing that I explain and then I bring it to workshop and the workshop is like, why have you explained this? The integrity <laughs> of the prose is lost. This is a terrible line. Please take it out. And it's like, okay, well, sorry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's harsh. <laughs> workshop is harsh. That is harsh. That is um, harsh. But yeah, oh my gosh. Um, well, uh, I, my last, my last question for you sure. is, uh, is just about, about teaching and how, how has teaching at Penn been for you and how has it affected Joan or, yeah. or affected anything else in yeah. your writing life? Um, well, teaching is always sort of this mixed bag of kind of, you know, I, I think it's very generative in terms of meeting the students, seeing what they're doing. Um, I think some of the, some of the things like when I read their work, I sort of get a sense of like contemporary readership, which is really nice, mm-hmm. right? What they're reading, what they're interested in, so um, and what they're what they're concerned about, right? And what they're concerned about their characters. Um, teaching has taught me a lot about writing because there's so much close reading. Like you're a really close reader. I mean, you know, you're 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 like sort of line by line in a in a certain way that I'm I think also only a teach- writer. Yes, yes, <laughs> but you're wonderful at like, going line by line as well. And I think that comes from reading, writing, yeah. and teaching, yeah. right? Like yeah. being able to point to a section and say, "This is how you're supposed to do it," or "This is how you're not supposed to do it." Um, and I think that's what being at Penn has been like, which is, you know, incredible students, incredible writing, but also mm-hmm. thinking about, you know, how do I get this information to them in the easiest way that they can at least attempt to do it? Since mm-hmm. writing is, 
writing is kind of a more of a lifestyle than it is sort of you know 100 percent right like the the you take a class and now you're a writer right but mm-hmm. it, it's sort of a choice that you have to make and with workshop teaching workshop i think um it, it is like you said sometimes it can be a little brutal because one of the things i have to always remind people and my students is you're not going to be there to defend your work oh ever God. right yeah. like your parents are not going to be there to kind of called them out on it you know you can't <laughs> you can't go on goodreads and answer all the bad reviews no, I've, you I've, I've tried and the publisher said you cannot do that <laughs> um so like you can't defend your work so if you have to if you feel the need to always have to explain yourself in workshop that's a really good reminder of yeah. what it's going to be like many folds in the public absolutely. space you know? absolutely yeah. My favorite Goodreads review was a friend of mine um, wrote wrote a really wonderful book, and one of our Goodreads reviewers said three stars, and the line was, "Was gonna give it a two. It got a little better." <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was like, "This is why we don't read Goodreads reviews." <laughs> it's, it's so terrifying. It's, I know, it's so terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's so random. Like like every review is given equal weight depending on uh, like what they write. I was just like, you know, you can't you can't read your reviews. That's no. I think you just have them. to write with with it in mind that right. yeah, with this with this thing in mind that I, whatever I'm giving you, you are gonna be, be able to digest it. Yes, yes. Um. Well, I wanted to ask if you guys had any questions for Waikiki. Yeah, I think is there is there a hand floating in the back? And there's uh, yes, there's a mic floating around somewhere. Hi, sorry. I had like two questions. Yeah. Sure. That's all right. I think one is like more logistically. I was wondering like, obviously this has a lot of like technical factual stuff in it, and because you have like the degree, the background like science and chemistry and epistemology, um, I was wondering like, did you have to go out again and do research, like interviews specifically for this book, or did you were you able to kind of like rely on your own background mm-hmm. and knowledge? Um, so I had never rounded in the ICU. I rounded more in cardiology, so uh, or internal medicine in the wards. So I think I needed someone to take me to the unit. Um, and I had, luckily, you know, a friend who is an ICU doctor at Columbia who let me round and touch ECMO. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like no one was attached to it, but I was, you know, um, able to meet ECMO. <laughs> and then um, I had another, you know, great friend at Mount Sinai who was able to kind of get me into their ward or their you know unit um and sort of just seeing the schedule right like sort of 9 a.m um to 12 like what are they doing and when do they like do the afternoon stuff and then mostly just like interviewing them i mean doctors really do like being interviewed about their job you know i mean you shouldn't (laughs) tell them what you're writing about but like they really do like talking about their work um so that was pretty easy that you could kind of get them to talk about what what do they see mostly um, what kind of you know what kind of procedures they're doing? Um, I think ICU doctors like talking about their procedures a lot, so machines and things like that. Um, and so I did end up talking to a lot of people and sort of just a little bit of my own background knowledge. But once COVID started, I, it was really hard to get back in there. So what I did at that time was. YouTube is great. I think there's a lot of people who are filming things and what a day is like during that pandemic period. Um, I was reading a lot of articles and op-eds written by nurses because they do a lot of the you know heavy lifting for like patient care. Like the doctor's the architect. You know the nurses are sort of like the the soldiers and the NPs and things like that. Um, so it was it was nice to sort of see a collection of that. And I did quite a bit of reading of like personal essays and you know watching videos and watching YouTube and just like getting things right. But like with all research, you don't use all of it. Like if I put in all the research I knew about the ICU, this would be such a boring book. It would just be an <laughs> ICU manual, and there are already lots of those. So um, it's like putting it in and then taking it out yeah Thank you. yeah of course because I, I think it is mm-hmm. uh, I was also wondering like I really love what you said about how like even though like writers they are not necessarily writing the race or like identity that they are from yeah. and it's kind of like as an Asian American writer like a lot of my characters look like me mm-hmm. but I also want to be like capable of and like be allowed to like write characters of like different races and identities Mm -hmm. but because like your last two books like Joan is okay and chemistry were like both like Asian like Chinese American women like Asian American women I think Mm -hmm. I was wondering like how do you balance that and do you in your like do you ever like 
write a lot like of these other like characters and stuff mm-hmm. um that's a good question you know i think um i don't just because i feel like i have this like personal responsibility for it's like representation is just a heavy responsibility um so um I mean, you know, they're, like Stephen King is not going to write a Joan character, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I sort of feel like there's there's kind of this this sort of burden to write a character like this as well, um, because you can only do a book once, and you only have so many books left in your career, right? Um, and you can only publish like so many times, right? <laughs> so many ideas, you yeah. know. And sometimes you put all of your energy into this book, and there there is this desire to be seen, um, to sort of kind of write a narrative that you think has nuance to it to sort of contribute to a canon that's maybe not like like the western traditional canon right um and i mean i i I think you know um currently i'm not writing sort of other characters unless i'm kind of like there's a reason that i want to do it and also i just want to do it well and sometimes you know i i feel like if i go into another sphere it's a little bit more research i have to do it well and then i feel like i'm not living up to par to to maybe certain issues in you know in that identity that i just don't know about right Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. yeah of course uh, hi. So hi. on the topic of like the weight that you feel as an yeah. author, how do you think about uh, breaking down versus reinforcing stereotypes with your writing? So I completely agree there's like a lack of like Asian Americans in yeah. a lot of media, but yeah. also the ones that are in media are like doctors and engineers. Yeah. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I kind of think, I, I do think it's a cyclic problem, right? So I knew Joan was going to be a female doctor. Um, and I think the sense of kind of, rebelling against certain sort of tropes would be kind of acknowledging how much power those tropes completely have over you and also erasing i know so many people like joan i guess like half of my graduating class in some ways um and to not write about these people is just to pretend that they don't exist for like the one percent right um the you know the asian that rebels or whatever um and i I thought i i didn't want to do that because i wanted to write this story about you know joan but to avoid some of the tropes, there's a sense that, I mean, she has interiority, of course. She's funny. She sort of has an endearing quality to her. And sure, she has a lot of flaws that are maybe echoing of a certain personality I'm trying to get at. But the, th- the whole point is, by the end of the book, my hope is that the reader is on Joan's side. And I think that's sort of the best way of kind of breaking down stereotypes that, you know, I don't want to acknowledge that they don't exist and they don't exist for, you know, they exist for a reason. But I also want a better understanding of like what are the forces that create a Joan. There are a lot of external factors that create a doctor like this. You know, a lot of training, a lot of kind of conditioning, um, and to ignore that would almost be like ignoring, you know, a lot of the work that someone like Joan put in to kind of make it to where she is. So. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you both mentioned earlier on in the conversation about biculturalism and yeah. what that means in your works. Have either of your works been translated into mm-hmm. the languages of the characters you speak of, whether it's Bengali or Cantonese or Mandarin? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And do you think how your books would be translated, would it all uh, dictate a different understanding of the books or provide an opportunity to creatively experiment in a way that is challenging or different when writing in English? That's a great question. I don't know. I know chemistry's been translated. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Your, your first book. It hasn't been translated into any South Asian languages. Okay. And so I don't, uh, I, but I think about this a lot, like, because I feel like, especially, like, especially with writing fiction, um, like, even just the passage I just read today, right. this is a character who is expressing all these thoughts in English, right. because I'm writing it in English. But in fact, he is ex- thinking all these thoughts in his head in Bengali, right? Mm-hmm. And so if, if it were to be translated into Bengali specifically, um, I... I wonder how I would feel about that. I wonder <laughs> how I would view his thoughts via his own language because for so long I have been translating his thoughts for him into mm-hmm. English, which b- which was why I was sort of harping on about the question of like, what what are Asian thoughts and how how do we mm-hmm. express them in English? And and if you if you reverse the question, it becomes a completely different one, right? Like what right. are what are English thoughts and how do we express you them? You would in probably Asian have to language? change something. <laughs> right? I, I you, think you so. You have to rewrite I, some 
sexual. I do not think that it could be a, yeah. a, a word for word translation. Yeah. I, it, I think it would right. it would be a very different. I mean, idiomatic expressions aside, of course, one cannot do a word for word translation into any language of, of any language because idiomatic expressions exist. But even aside from that, if we're talking about retranslating back into the language which the character was originally supposed to be thinking in, mm -hmm. that becomes a really complicated question. I don't know. Was was uh, was chemistry translated in China? Yeah, it was. Um, the title, they translated the title, too. They translated it into, like, Chinese girl, I think, into Chinese. And I don't know why. I, no one asked me <laughs> about that. Um, and I think after that point, after you and I started reading the first couple of pages and just being like, if I, you, you either get totally interested in it and you have to, like, redo the entire thing or, you, you know, work on another book. Um, so it has been translated into Chinese. I, I do think, I think during a translation, they think about the audience, right? The writer never really thinks about the audience until you get to publication or marketing or whatever. Um, but but the translator is really thinking about the audience. So like the audience, if they're native Chinese speakers, what what would echo and make sense to them? You might mm -hmm. have to rewrite some sections. And I did, they actually sent me, you know, they're like, you can't explain how to write Chinese to a Chinese person. That makes no sense, right? Yeah. So you, you're gonna have to like <laughs> tweak that. Um, so there's, yeah, yeah this whole thing the about downside. the name. Yeah, the downside would be, would be hard. Because like, yeah, right? Just the name, Joan. How are they going to translate that name if the surprise of the name is later on in the story, right? <laughs> so I've thought about that, and I have, I have no solutions. Um, and I think that is somewhat of the downside, a little bit, of trying to kind of be in that gray area of both languages, totally. but not firmly in one one language. I mean, one, you know, I teach translations in my class and um, one book that I teach is called The Convenience Store Woman and it's mm. written toll in Japanese, but it's written, she's a Japanese writer, she's writing in a Japanese world, she's, every character is Japanese, there's no um, hyphenation there of American. And then I think those stories work a little bit better when translation because mm. you're translating it totally into another dominant culture and then they just right. kind of assume. Um, and you'll see that in, in that book, The Communist Normal Woman, there's not mention, one mention that she's Japanese. It's obviously just assumed to the reader right. that she's Japanese. Because any character that that writer would write right. would be Japanese. In Japanese, right. in, yeah. in Japan, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. Living and, you know, growing up in Japan. But, the, and, you know, in, in the translation, there's no mention that she's Japanese. But obviously, no reader is going to sit there and say, oh, she's American white in right. that way, right? So there's some stories that I think work kind of in translation and some that would need a little bit of finessing, yeah. The thing I'll say about the, the Joan point, though, yeah. is is the idea that, like, I mean, why do we even read in English-speaking characters in English? It's, to, it's right. to notice what the author wants to say to us about that, right? And, like, the yeah. this idea about how Juan is written in Chinese characters, mm -hmm. that is something that even if I was a fluent speaker, I would want to hear your explanation of that. Right, You know, and true. even if I was if even if I was writing in characters every day, I'd still want to hear about right. your the story you told yourself to learn that character. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a question right at the back. Hi, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to comment as maybe like the uh, mom in the group. I, the masks <laughs> are good for some things. They're still uh, crow's feet that stick out. But um, I'm hoping that what I'm mostly assuming is like younger students in the audience heard so much of what you said that's not exactly about the book. And that's how you spent four years thinking you're a chemist and you have um, a PhD in something that you don't currently practice. And you no. moved and did this and you moved and did that. And I think it's sort of um, inherent in the struggle that your character goes through in chemistry, but as a mom of mm -hmm. one of these, uh, you know, <laughs> high-stress students, oh. I'm hoping that they took that in, that you have changed your path numerous times. And as my parents told me when I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore, um, <laughs> education is never wasted. And I right. think writing is one of those things where all those things you did that you're not actually the chemist now, they all just mix in there and mm -hmm. you draw from them mm -hmm. to make you a complete writer. So that's sort of a comment, not a question. And then here's a question, which is, I don't know if this question sort of adds to the burden you were referring to of maybe feeling like now you're meant to carry the mantle of you know, Chinese American writing yeah. and women. But as I was reading, I was wondering if you would ever some point consider doing um, maybe a young adult novel mm. or something, right. because I would think that these things would be great for adolescent girls, uh, you know, 
young women, although maybe your publisher would hate my even asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, I think about this in terms of, I, I sometimes even want to write a children's book, you know, it's just like, everyone's happy and, you know, you're just, you're, there's no Good angst endings. that you yeah. have to really deal with, right? <laughs> um, and you get to look at pictures. Uh, um, and why middle school literature is slightly different, I think just because there's a little bit more parameters on, you sort of have a guardrail. Um, and having just knowing a little bit about that editorial process, I, I, it would really have to be a clean story for me to want to tackle it. Um, sometimes with literary fiction and sort of fiction with older characters, you're allowed to be a little bit more messy and ambiguous. I think sometimes a younger audience needs something somewhat more black and white in terms of kind of the trajectory. So I, I'm totally open to it. I'm also open to, like, I want to write, you know, horror stories as well. I just want to <laughs> kind of go into a different genre. But or speculative, but I think it would have to be like a clean story that I've, I've figured out um, plot-wise. This book taught me so much about plotting and figuring out you know mm -hmm. pieces of a puzzle. And hopefully if I have a good, more plot-driven story that also has great characters, I can kind of try other, um, try other writing styles and other genres. Um, I, I'm, I'm open to it, I'm certainly open to it. Um, and you know, YA books sell so much better than literary fiction. So yeah. that is also another reason. Huge reason to do Huge it. Huge reason to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do we have time for maybe one more? Anybody? Can I see somebody over here? Is there a question? Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. I think we're good. Okay. Oh, it's oh, okay. Yeah, we <laughs> we <do. laughs> There's yeah, also one up uh, here. There's, yeah. Uh, uh, my question was just, um, I felt like, uh, I think someone made a comment that chemistry was very, um, was uh, octal fishes in a way that you kind of applied your own experience in chemistry mm -hmm. to the character. And I haven't read this book yet, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I feel like the voice in this book is probably a, like a, a stronger kind of version mm -hmm. of the voice in chemistry. I'm not sure. But <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering if when you wrote this character, you kind of in your head, maybe unconsciously or consciously kind of progressed from the character that you wrote in your last book. Yeah, book. I mean, my yeah. editor actually said this after, you know, it started launching that this is kind of like a big sister voice in some ways. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. sometimes I, I feel like I really just monopolized like three of my friends and put them in this blender <laughs> and then <laughs> neither of them will own up that this is how they work and think. But, you know, that that was kind of the stronger character is this voice. I just knew this voice really well. It wasn't my own voice in the same way that some of chemistry is sort of blended with my own anxieties. This one, it was kind of just like, you know, how do you talk? What do you talk about? Like, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it, it was a little bit more of like a reaching out and figuring out that voice. I love that. Last question up here. Um, my question's kind of similar. I think you answered it to a certain extent, but I was wondering, um, how did Joan, the character, come to you? And mm -hmm. what was that like, um, just processing her and beginning to understand how she yeah. wanted to be written as a character. Um, so, you know, contrary to the second half of the book, we went through so many facelifts. The first part of this book did not, like the first scene where mm -hmm. it was, um, the first sentence, when I think about people, I think about space, how much space a person takes up and how much use that person provides. The utilitarian aspect of Joan came to me right away when I read that sentence, or when I wrote that sentence. And that title came to me because I sort of knew that name and knew the translation pretty easily. Um, so that was actually, the, the character of Joan kind of came to me pretty quickly. Um, I'd been sort of dealing with kind of a character like that with, in a friend group, a, a, in a story, and I was like, why don't I just put this character in a novel? Um, and then when I wrote that sentence about how she thinks about people, just like height, weight, space, utility, and I thought, it's kind of funny. Some, somewhat true, but, but, but then if I could develop that into a narrative, you know, she starts out, the way I write her is she starts out as this black character, right? She has this very, very focused view of life. And I thought, what do you do with a character like that? You know, you make her uncomfortable. You, like, put her through plot. You sort of, it's like Emma. Emma starts off being handsome, privileged, and rich. What do you do with a character like that? And you, knowing what you, she wants. Right. Yeah. And, like, you toss her out. You kind yeah. of, like, push her down. And so what do I do with a character who just believes that this is the right 
ver- world view, you kind of have to like jostle it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really did come from that first scene of her, the way that she thinks about people. And then, you know, her father dies. So then events start to propel her into maybe this, her own story. If I can just add to that question yeah. for a second, did she, when you started putting her in situations that she didn't want to be in, yeah. did her reactions surprise you at all? Sort of. I mean, there's just, there's, she's, oh, she was so hard. She was very stubborn. Um, <laughs> she lived in my mind for like four years. Um, and most of the time it was just resistance. Like if Joan were to write a book, she would never, nothing would happen in this book. She would just go to go to hospital, round, come back, go to hospital, be on service like 24 weeks. Um, so I think that that would be her story. And I just, it was a lot of kind of fighting back against that yeah. and sort of figuring out when can I get her like a little bit angry because I knew mm. there was anger under mm. the surface. Like a character like this, she doesn't become this person without anger, right? Um, and so I wanted to kind of tap into that rage. And I think some of it is her brother, you know, saying, mm-hmm you should marry someone because like now your career is done. You should probably marry someone. And uh, you, um, people at work thinking that, oh, well, she got promoted because diversity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when maybe she's just like doing her job. Mm-hmm. Um, so things like that, I was trying to kind of get a little bit, get it, getting her a little bit uncomfortable and angry that she would sort of have a moment of just like, stop, you know, stop, stop messing with me yeah. in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm really excited for you guys to meet Joan. And in the meantime, Waiki, I think, is going to sign some copies yeah, for I'm us happy. if you guys um, are willing to get in line. Is that is that here? Is that at I the table know. back there? Um, Writers House people. But can we give Waiki a round of applause? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was so great. Awesome. This, this is my only in-person event for Joan. It's like amazing. I've no, I haven't had an in-person event We are for Joan. so it's lucky. Been, it's this been is so exciting. Zoom the whole time, so... Thank you, guys. Writer's House is a magical place. (laughs) 